Hey, Elm Springs, it's Pastor Jenny. Welcome back to Wednesday Word. I'm glad to get it, get it kicked back off with you. We are starting a new series called Wednesday Weird, Strange Stories from the Bible. And honestly, this is the perfect week to start this series about weird Bible stories because it's already been a pretty weird week so far. We've had snow in April. Uh, there's been a critter running laps around my ceiling in my office. And we also decided, just as a way to really live into the weirdness of uh, what we're going to be talking about, uh, to film these uh, little lessons in our basement that where, where youth used to meet here at Elm Springs. But now we have elevated them to the second floor of the worship building. So, you know, thanks be to God. When we are looking at these stories of the Bible, we, there's a lot of things in the Bible that we can really just get behind, no problem. But then we run across those stories or those sayings, and it kind of stops us in our tracks. And we're like, I don't really know. I don't know what to do with that. And so I thought we'd just talk about a few of those over the coming weeks. And um, one of the first, this one today we're going to talk about is a, something that Jesus says in the middle of his ministry. And, you know, there's a lot of really powerful and challenging things that Jesus says but most of them we can we can get on board with. You know, Jesus talks about a lot about loving your neighbor, uh, loving your neighbor as yourself, uh, loving your enemies, praying for those who persecute you. And, and yes, sometimes loving and praying for people who uh, are hard to love is difficult. But we understand why Jesus asks us to do those things. But then occasionally Jesus throws a wild pitch and we are faced with understanding what he's really saying. And this today's uh, lesson is definitely one of those times. It comes from the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to go ahead and read it for you right now. Starting in chapter 14, verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has hear, ears to hear, let them hear. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. There's a lot, a lot going on in that passage. But I want to focus uh, today on the first few lines, the ones that say, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, they cannot be my disciple. Goodness, <laughs> that seems harsh. It also seems completely counter to the rest of Jesus' preaching and teaching and, and really the gospel. I think about how John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish but live. And, you know, how are we supposed to reconcile that? with these words from Jesus. I mean, I thought we weren't supposed to hate anyone, but especially not your father and your mother and your, your wife and children and, and, and your family. That just seems like, what are you talking about, Jesus? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can follow you into that. I was listening to a podcast about this passage, and one of the hosts said, one of the most dangerous things you can do is to read one and only one verse of the Bible or one passage of scripture. His point was you can't pull one thing that Jesus says out of the out of context without looking at the rest of the things that Jesus said, taught, 
preached and did. And so if Jesus tells us to love our neighbors and our enemies and strangers and the least of these, then what does it mean when Jesus also says that we must hate our families in order to be his disciple? Well, here's what we need to know. When this word hate is used in this way throughout scripture, it typically isn't talking about hate as an emotion opposite of love. It's usually talking about, in hyperbolic fashion, it's talking about uh, a level of preference. And so it's not that we're, Jesus is saying you can't love your family. It's just that you have to put your family in order, in, in the right order of your priorities. There are times in scripture when, uh, when God is quoted through the prophets talking about um, when he's speaking to the Israelites, trying to tell them how he loves them. Uh, he says, I loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Well, how can this be? Because the Bible also says that God is love. And so how can the God who embodies love also hate someone or, or even a group of people? Does this mean God hates Esau and, and Esau's descendants? I don't think so. I think Jesus coming to earth and offering salvation to all people, not just the Israelites, not just God's chosen, sort of leaves no room for doubt about whether or not God loved Esau. But it does mean that God's priority throughout history and throughout our Old Testament scripture, God's priority was on the people of Israel, the descendants of Jacob. And so God protects Israel. God saves them and God corrects them. And God brings about salvation in Jesus through the line of Israel, through the line of Jacob. Esau, in this story, is not the priority. Let's apply that same lens from this, for the, on this passage from Luke. First of all, Jesus is, has turned around, stopped what he's doing, and he's addressing these huge crowds that were following him, these people who were just enamored with him. And now some in the crowds were true believers. They had really had this amazing encounter with Christ and chosen to give up their lives to follow him. But so many more of them are just fascinated by the trick pony that Jesus has become. They love to watch him perform signs and wonders and miracles, but they really have no uh, idea uh, or maybe they're not ready to truly understand what it means to follow him. And so Jesus stops and he says to them, he says, listen, if you want to be my disciple, if you truly want to follow after me, you have to make me, you have to make this mission a priority. So if there comes a time when you have to choose between your family or the life that you've always lived, your mom, your dad, your even your kids, your brothers and sisters, well, then I have to come first. That's just part of it. Jesus is saying, my way of discipleship is sacrifice, and you need to know that now before you get any deeper. Jesus felt this sacrifice as well. You might remember that um, later on in his life, and certainly after his death and resurrection, Mary, his mother, and his brothers James and Jude were instrumental in the early church. But during Jesus' life, during his ministry on earth, uh, there were times when Mary and his brothers really thought that he had gone out of his mind. And they would come and they would try to stop him from preaching and teaching because they thought that he had lost it. And Jesus knew, though, even during these times when his family was, was rejecting his message, he knew that he had to keep pressing forward and keep living out this purpose that God had sent him to do. He had to keep going on the mission of salvation, no matter what the cost. So the point of this strange, weird, and, and difficult passage isn't that we have to pick who we love or who we hate. God calls us to love everyone and to, and to serve others. But the point is, we always serve and love God first. God has to be our priority. It, this teaching from Jesus makes us realize that following him has to be number one. It is not something 
we casually do. We cannot be casual disciples of Jesus. And Jesus just wants people to know what they're getting into when they start calling themselves a Christian, a little Christ. So today I invite you to join me as we think about what it really means to be a disciple of Christ and and to join me in counting the cost, knowing that whatever we have to sacrifice here in our lives on earth, the the abundance of, of Christ that we receive when we choose to follow in his footsteps far surpasses anything that we could give up. And thanks be to God for that. Let's pray. God, we know that when we choose to become your disciples, we have to count the cost. It's not a, it's not a cheap or a casual decision. And yet, when we follow you, when we make you a priority, our life is filled with abundance and love and family that we could never have expected. Help us to love others, but at the same time, help us to keep our love for you first and foremost in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us, and we'll be right here next week for another week of Wednesday Weird. See you then.